Thank you. Okay. Uh, so um, we got off to a great start this morning, and uh, we will continue with this uh, great work uh, that we're featuring here this year with Rebecca Price. Uh, it was in 2009 that Rebecca was here as a trainee uh, receiving a travel award to attend this meeting. And fast forward, uh, I don't know how many years is it, 13 years later or so, uh, here we are with her being um, really uh, uh, an established investigator and doing some wonderful, remarkable things. Uh, one of the things that I've been advocating for years, um, pointing out that uh, the psychological interventions that are used extensively uh, in treating psychopathology have largely evolved without any knowledge about the brain. Uh, and I've been uh, sort of urging people, particularly new investigators, to think about what I've called neurally inspired behavioral interventions. Um, and Rebecca is really doing that uh, in uh, a wonderful way and also developing hybrid interventions, uh, combining pharmaceutical and behavioral approaches based on a uh, more uh, complete uh, deeper understanding of the neural circuits important for emotion regulation and other aspects of psychopathology. Um, Rebecca received her undergraduate degree at Stanford, then went on to Rutgers to receive her PhD in clinical psychology, uh, and then did an internship at Pittsburgh and um, uh, has, I think, never left P Pittsburgh since, uh, and has worked her way up the ranks. Uh, she has received uh, numerous honors and uh, has been publishing uh, many very influential papers uh, and some of the recent work uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the combination of ketamine and psychological approaches to treating psychopathology have garnered lots of attention recently. Um, and uh, uh, I think this work really is the kind of work that is helping to elucidate the mechanisms underlying uh, uh, both the both the kind of emotion dysregulation associated with particular kinds of psychopathology and uh, how we can change those circuits in ways that relieve suffering. So uh, it's great to have Rebecca here, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming her. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it really is a little surreal to be back um, all, these, all these years later, and I, I so vividly remember being a, a travel awardee in the audience in fact, I thought I was losing it because I remember exactly what the room looked like and this wasn't it. So Richie confirmed that this is not the same room that all those memories were, were stored with. But um, yeah, it, it's such a unique and, and amazing um, conference and really can't just, I'm so humbled and honored to, to be invited back. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start by just describing the scope of this problem that, um, I and so many others are working to, to help with, and that's the impact of anxiety and depression. These are the two most prevalent mental health conditions, um, classes of mental health conditions worldwide. Um, and they're so prevalent that the truth is every single one of us knows multiple people in our lives, people who are important to us, who are, have struggled with one or both of these, um, sometimes in silence. Um, this is something that's impacting our loved ones um, and those around us in our communities um, to a great, very great degree. Um, these are conditions that that sap away some of our most fundamental and cherished kind of human capacity. So sapping away capacity for, for passion and, and um, 
and fulfillment in life and in, and um, to the ability to experience awe and wonder and this sense of purpose, connectedness to others, um, and replace them with, with dread, despair, self-loathing, loneliness. So these are devastating and the conditions that have a staggering um, effect on humanity. And we can also quantify the, the effects um, more in, in numbers. So um, we're talking about depression being called the leading cause of disability worldwide. And that's because of the, the combination, the toxic combination of how prevalent it is and how very disabling and, and impairing it is. Um, so there's been estimated $1.15 trillion per year lost to these conditions. And that's because of, of the 12 billion days a year of um, lost productivity that they're robbing from us. And um, we have now 1 million lives annually and rising that are being lost to suicide. And anyone who has experienced um, a loss to suicide understands the devastating ripple effects that each one of those, those lives, those lost lives has on, on the community and the network around it. Um, and right now, many people are talking about this second pandemic of mental health conditions that we're living through right now and how these conditions are, are even all the more exacerbated and taking a, a particularly uh, uh, great toll on our young people right now, but really across the lifespan, we're seeing rises in these conditions. Um, so um, there, there are numerous effective treatments for depression and anxiety. So I don't want to um, fail to note that there is help available. There are um, medications and psychotherapies that are evidence-based and quite helpful for many people. Um, there's also room for improvement on how we, we can help people with these conditions. And so um, one of the, the things, um, these are kind of my personal kind of uh, laundry list of, of goals for how could we really improve upon the status quo um, of how, how our treatments currently are working. So one um, aspect of our conventional treatments is that they take several weeks, um, even months to reach therapeutic efficacy. So you have people left vulnerable um, during those times while they're waiting for a therapy to kick in. And then um, kind of compounded with that, we often have a trial and error process. It has to be gone through in order to find a treatment that works for that specific person. So in each one of those takes that, that kind of lagged amount of time. So if we could have something with a rapid therapeutic onset within hours, um, this would be a, a major advance and would have the capacity to, to address a psychiatric crises, such as a suicidal crisis, for example. Um, I, we also have a really um, a, a big problem with a, a, a a supply that's far outpaced by the demand. So we need interventions that are efficient, that are gonna require a limited amount of time from practitioners and from the patients so that we can get people well quickly, but then still hopefully have an enduring effect to really chart a new course and change the trajectory of, of a whole life. Um, but you know, as, as I mentioned, there, there's this supply and demand issue. So the, these uh, conventional interventions require expert administration, and we just don't have the, the supply of experts to meet that demand, especially in um, under-resourced areas or rural communities, et cetera. So um, the, to the extent we can make our treatments less resource intensive, then we might be able to meet the demand much more easily. Um, and then ideally um, getting new, new approaches that could help um, the 30 to 50% of patients who ultimately are labeled treatment resistant because they try one or more of our evidence-based treatments and don't get the same benefit that others have gotten. Um, so in pursuing those goals of kind of um, improving on our treatment, um, one scientific guidepost that I um, ended up sort of coming, that came into focus for me was this idea of neuroplasticity and how we can really leverage neuroplasticity. Um, so I'm using this as a really broad umbrella term for the brain's capacity to flexibly adjust and reorganize itself in response to a changing environment. So this is a, a, an incredibly complex um, set of cascading events, but there's um, certain key findings that have been integrated into um, models of how depression and other kind of stress-related conditions manifest. And so what you're seeing here is an illustration of um, over on the left, 
the effect of chronic stress on synapses um, and the synap the spiny synapses on dendrites in the brain, where you see this kind of withering away um, in response to exposure to chronic stress in animal models. Um, and this is in, in key um, circuits that are related to affective regulation, like the medial prefrontal cortex and the and um, limbic areas like the hippocampus. And so this is very much been integrated into psychiatry and to the, uh, the conceptualization of something like depression as being um, a, a state that's um, characterized by synaptic disconnectivity and um, impairments in, in the kind of all of the various mechanisms, many of the various mechanisms that um, support the health and the strength of synaptic, synaptic connections in the brain. So um, this, this is really just here to show you just how complex we're uh, of a of, uh, picture we're talking about. Um, and so there's so much work being gone, done, has been done, and is continuing to, continuing to be done to really um, delineate at a very micro scale the, the molecular neuronal substrates of this and how it all works. And so this is not the focus of my work. This is, this is more inspiration for my work. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I, I've sort of drawn more conceptually from this framework. And so I really like this model proposed um, by Castron in 2005, where you see in the upper left quadrant, just a depiction of this healthy brain, where it's just characterized by having sort of the, the right number of points of contact between neurons or nodes within the brain. And then you see beside that the depiction of a depressed brain, where we have this evidence that there's a withering away of some of those points of contact in this synaptic depression state. So maybe what we wanna do during treatment down on the bottom is just proliferate more points of contact and create more pathways for the, for the brain to be able to kind of flexibly traverse. Um, so that then experience dependent plasticity mechanisms can kick in and, um, and hold on to retain those pathways that are most supportive of adaptive functioning and get somebody back to a recovered brain that looks very much like the healthy brain. Um, so as a, as a psychologist, I just became really fascinated by whether that's related in some way to what patients are saying to me when they're sitting in the room about, you know, this, this, I, this constrained um, set of options or possibilities that seem um, to be available to them. So behaviorally in their thought patterns that people are describing kind of rigid, narrow, inflexible patterns that they're plagued by. Um, and so I, I got interested in whether that's, that's kind of just the, the same construct at a different level of analysis. Um, so if we think about neuroplasticity from a developmental kind of broad strokes um, level, we can ask well, when, when in our lifetime is plasticity at its highest point? Well, it's in infancy and early childhood, very early childhood. So um, what really struck me as a mom with my, with my infants and young children was just how utterly open and free to experience things in the moment they, they seem to be. You know, they're, they're very much not stuck in one way of being. They're just kind of drawn to whatever curiosity or mood state um, comes along and, and they sort of freely float through that. They have that capriciousness. So it's, um, I, I'm just curious about whether that's related to this plasticity that's there um, kind of, um, that's there developmentally to help them be influenced moment to moment by their experience and be able to kind of be highly susceptible to inputs from their environment. But then across the lifespan, we move from that sort of exuberant, extravagant plasticity to become more buttoned up. Um, this helps us, of course, to be productive and to, to stay safe and um, use, apply logic and reason and forethought, um, become the upstanding citizens that we're meant to be. Um, and that is linked to some of these, the, the kind of um, pruning away of some of that plasticity through experience dependent synaptic pruning and white matter myelination that's going to um, uphold and solidify the, the specific brain pathways that are most Im important to support adaptive functioning. But so maybe the, the idea with conditions like depression and anxiety is that in the, in the context of chronic stress exposure or just feeling as if you're constantly under threat, um, you, the pendulum sort of slips goes too far the other direction, and you end up with this impaired neuroplasticity and synaptic depression um, where things become very stuck in, in one way of being. 
Um, so in my research program, I've been working from that as a conceptual framework um, to try to understand how the things we can see in animal neuroscience at the neuronal and molecular level might sort of propagate up the system to get all the way to the clinical symptoms that a patient um, presents with. And so, um, you know, we've been curious about, and I had the, the great privilege to work with the late, great Ron Duman, a, a preeminent animal neuroscientist in this area to kind of piece together a, a theoretical review where we were just talking about the, the sort of um, the, the symmetry that you see, the way that these things seem to sort of rhyme with one another at these different levels of analysis. So you have the neuronal and molecular synaptic depression findings, mostly from animal neuroscience. Then you have in humans, um, a broad literature on prefrontal and limbic function um, being altered in patients with these conditions and, and particularly perhaps the connectivity and the sort of integration across different regions and networks being altered. And so maybe that then feeds forward to some of these alterations we see consistently in affective information processing. So things like red, rigid and negatively biased patterns in attention, memory, self-representations, decision-making, and more that are affecting the way that a person um, experiences, perceives, and processes each and every environment that they enter. And so if you have those types of biases um, affecting the, that um, kind of conscious experience in every situation, then maybe that gives you that bridge to uh, arrive at the types of clinical symptoms, the chronic mood states, and the, the kind of um, behavioral shifts in, in what people are, um, are doing um, in, in response to those biases. Um, so ultimately, what I actually really care about is to use this as a roadmap to create those, those new, no, new uh, treatment paradigms that I mentioned to kind of fill in some of those gaps in what we can currently do to help our patients and see if we can um, find a way to, to deliver treatments that are both um, fast acting, but also um, enduring and long lasting. And maybe we can get a more efficient way of doing that if we kind of tackle multiple levels of analysis of neuro, neuro, multiple neuroplasticity mechanisms in tandem or kind of um, synergistically together. So that's what my talk is really going to be about. I'm going to draw out two different examples in my research program of how we've tried to do that. So the first example, um, we're, we're using neuromodulation to create kind of focal uh, neuroplasticity within a certain brain region and pairing that with a synergistically um, with a computer-based um, tr behavioral treatment. Um, I tend to use a lot of computer-based interventions because again, that, that idea of not being very resource intensive, being something that could be disseminated widely is very appealing to me as well. So um, this particular line of work is in the area of compulsive behavior disorders. Um, so what do we mean by compulsive behaviors. This is just when an individual feels compelled to perform an action that's unwanted, repetitive, but lacks adaptive function. And it's performed in the hopes of reducing a negative state of distress. So this helps delineate compulsions from impulsive behaviors. Um, and compulsive behaviors may actually serve that function initially. So um, you can see, you know, for instance, somebody um, who has compulsive hand washing um, initially may, may have a short-term reduction in distress from washing hands and feeling that there's greater certainty that germs have been removed. Um, but very much so these behaviors themselves in the context of, of clinical manifestations, they become highly aversive to the person and are recognized as contrary to life goals, not actually helping them anymore. So the question is why do they persist anyway? Um, so in this context of compulsive behaviors, um, one of the core neurocognitive substrates that's been described is this difficulty shifting between goal-directed and habitual um, actions that these that are two different systems that are, are, exist in organisms um, that allow for our decision-making to be both efficient and flexible. And so they're both there, but it seems as if maybe the balance between the two is altered in the context of compulsive behaviors. So you can study this, um, you see in the, a kind of classical paradigm for studying these two systems in animal models, um, where a, 
a animal is just trained through repetition to have a really stamped in behavior of pushing a lever to get a reward, for instance, then you can devalue the cue. So for instance, you can introduce satiety. So the animal doesn't want that, that reward anymore. So then you can give a behavioral test and see the, uh, the way that these different um, uh, it's two systems can control behavior under different circumstances. So if the goal-directed system is in charge of decision-making at a given point in time, then the devalued cue will no longer evoke that response. Even though it's a habit to push the button, you can override that with goal-directed, with the goal-directed system because there's no longer a goal now that's relevant for that devalued cue. Um, whereas in a, if the habitual system is in the driver's seat, the cue will just keep on evoking the response because it's the habit that's been stamped in. And so my um, really brilliant collaborator, Claire Gillen, was among the first to um, talk about how this might relate to compulsive behaviors. And so you can sort of draw out an example where you think of um, a compulsive behavior as a sort of habit that's been stamped in over time in response to the triggers that typically evoke that behavior. Um, but as we discussed, the compulsive behavior fails to actually reduce distress much of the time. So you could think of that as it's, it's become devalued in that sense. Um, so maybe the problem and the reason why it persists anyway is that there's just not um, ample goal-directed control available to be able to override that habit. Um, and that's when you see this persistence of compulsive behavior. So the treatment goal then in the context of these conditions would be to enhance goal-directed override over habits and help somebody be able to override the habit um, through goal-directed action. Um, so we, we thought of that as our kind of treatment target to kind of um, boil this down to a neurocognitive um, substrate. And so then we wanted to think about, okay, at the neural level, what does that, at the neuroanatomical level, what does that relate to? Well, so, um, you know, the orbital frontal cortex in particular has been implicated in OCD um, since the very earliest PET imaging studies in the 80s were done. So we've seen, and still to this day, is one of the best replicated findings um, in neuroimaging where in, in kind of psychiatric populations where you see this overactive orbital frontal cortex um, at rest and during symptom provocation in patients with OCD. But the, those kinds of studies are limited by the cross-sectional design that, where you're just comparing a group of patients to a group of people that don't have that condition. And so my wonderful colleague and collaborator at the University of Pittsburgh, Susanna Mari, um, was able to use an experimental design to get at this, uh, to understand the orbital frontal cortex's role more precisely in an animal model through optogenetic stimulation. So she found that if you chronically stimulate the OFC, um, you see in a mouse model this, these repetitive grooming behaviors that lap ad lack adaptive function um, and look very much like a compulsive behavior in a, in a rodent. Um, so you can see that by stimulating the, the OFC. Um, however, um, it's, we, we know it's never quite that simple with the brain. The OFC doesn't do just one thing. So, um, you know, the, this, much of this work seems to implicate the OFC as kind of a, a central driver of habitual behaviors that are maladaptive, but other work suggest, you know, using similar optogenetic and chemogenetic tools has shown also and highlighted the importance of the OFC in enhancing goal-directed action. So it's also able to be used, a region of the brain that can be used for implementing goal-directed action can support that. So if you're trying to develop a treatment, you know, you sort of have a, a quandary of, of where these two competing models. It could be that the OFC is um, too low and yet you need to um, it, and in order to implement flexible goal-directed behavior, or it could be that the OFC is, is pushing habitual behavior and is over, overly active, and that one or the other of those could be the problem that you need to address. And all of this, you know, the, the, um, the complexity is that it would potentially depend upon the behavioral context. So if you're trying to actually override a habit which of these um, models is the right one? Which is the right intervention target? So you can kind of constrain the behavioral context for something like neuromodulation to make sure that you're, you're, um, you're fine tuning the, the neuromodulation to a behavioral context. And that's what we tried to do in this experiment. So we, we have these two kind of competing hypotheses. Maybe you need to 
turn the OFC up. Maybe you need to turn it down. Either way, what we're trying to do is help people enhance goal-directed habit override. And so we um, did an experiment modulating the OFC in two different directions. And we looked at just, first of all, did we succeed in pushing the OFC in two different directions, the OFC activation through neuroimaging? And then um, were we able to modify somebody's ability to resist compulsive behaviors in a triggering scenario as a behavioral marker? So in order to do that, um, that modulation of the OFC in two different directions, we chose theta burst stimulation, which has a continuous form you can give it in or an intermittent form. So the CTBS has been shown in um, motor cortex to be able to um, depotentiate the motor evoked potential. So reduce, you know, the, the basic activation of that region. And the ITBS does the opposite and potentiates the area. So we tried to apply those same pulse sequences that you can give by TMS in an experimental design, randomize people to either ITBS or CTBS, but, uh, but move the, the coil over the orbital frontal cortex. Um, but one thing I wanna highlight is how, how brief this stimulation actually is. So theta burst stimulation, one kind of run of it, one session of it is very short. It's either 40 seconds total or 192 seconds total. And that's all we did in this, in this experiment. So you can contrast that to a typical treatment paradigm in, um, in the sort of FDA approved um, depression treatment and other treatment, tr other treatment protocols where you're usually giving 30 to 40 minutes daily of TMS for four to six weeks straight. So it's quite um, a much more efficient um, amount of stimulation that we're giving here. Um, so here's our setup and here's how we kind of just uh, point the coil uh, as low as we can onto the orbital frontal area, um, targeting the left Broadman's area 10, um, using our neuro navigation system, which my lovely assistants are, are displaying here. And I wanna highlight Fabio Ferrelli, my TMS expert um, who helped in this work. Um, and so we give this, uh, this burst of either ITBS or CTBS to the OFC, but um, we wanted to do it in a behavioral context. We don't just want to manipulate the OFC and then call it a day. We want to do it within the context of learning to override habits, because that's really what we're, what our treatment target is. So we developed a computer-based habit override training. Um, so um, we basically give patients a habit, and it's an avoidance habit in the sense that what they have to do is push a button in response to a cue, and if they push the button, they avoid getting a shock to the foot on that side. So they're learning much like a compulsive behavior is trying to avoid some feared outcome. They're learning to push buttons to avoid a shock, an aversive outcome. And so they just get these habits stamped in through repetition, 480 trials that they're doing to, to kind of really stamp in with a, a range of cues, which button to push to which and get those habits. Then we give this one single session of either ITBS or CTBS in a, in a, parallel design randomized to one or the other. And then that then they right afterwards get the habit override training. So this is where we're really trying to get into that that goal that of overriding habits. And so how did we do that? We devalued one of the two cues. And by we devalued it by basically unplugging and showing and telling them this electrode isn't connected anymore. So now the button presses on that side are are pointless. Um, but the person then gets the same cues, um, maybe gets an urge to do a hab habitual button press and just kind of tries to um, do resist and override that habit. And so we saw that um, with during this habit override um, component, they, um, the participants did understand um, that there were safe cues. So there were some cues that had never been associated with a shock. So they knew very well that some cues didn't, pre didn't predict a shock. And they knew very well that the valued cue, the one that was still plugged in on that side, was going to predict a shock. But they weren't totally sure oh, on average about the, the devalued cue. And this we thought is actually, this was actually um, intentional, something we hope to see because uncertainty is an important part of what it feels like as, an, as a patient with a compulsive behavior trying to override a habit, you can't be totally sure that you're not going to have some devastating outcome occur. So being able to override a habit while you're tolerating some uncertainty, we thought was a good, a good um, kind of 
challenge and a good proxy for the clinical syndrome. So, and similarly, you see in, on the on the right panel that um, a they were still making some push button button pushes to the devalued cues. So even though they're not plugged in, that no longer serves a function, they are still pushing some of the time, at least some patients are. And this was important to see because it recapitulated the foundational work we were basing this paradigm off of, um, done again by, by Claire Gillen, where she had shown in patients with OCD, this very same pattern with a really similar paradigm. So that the patients with OCD that you see in orange, they continue to make some button presses to the devalued cues, but healthy comparisons in her study did not. So it looks like we're able to evoke a really similar behavioral pattern, but um, sort of elongated it to try to use it as a training opportunity to practice overriding habits. Okay, so last thing I need to explain about this experiment is how did we then test the success in terms of um, in a clinically relevant way? So how did we how do we know from this really brief experimental manipulation whether somebody might have a bit of a, a leg up on their compulsive behaviors, ideally their real ones that they really struggle with at, in the real world. So we um, collaboratively created with each patient an ideographic trigger, something that they said would trigger them to wanna do a compulsive behavior. So maybe it was touching a, a computer mouse that appears to them to be contaminated. Um, so then they were given access to their compulsive behavior. So maybe they're given access to hand sanitizer or hand washing in this example. Um, and then they were left alone for five minutes in the room and simply asked to do their best to resist their compulsive behavior. So then we can measure how much they reported that they had an urge to do the compulsive behavior, how much time they spent doing the compulsive behavior, and how much effort they needed to put in to resist doing their compulsive behavior. And this was our kind of short-term marker of vulnerability to their own compulsive behavior. So we can measure that in the lab in a way that's... Um, that can be done right on that same day that the TMS was given. And so we did it at 90 minutes after the TMS. And then we also did it at a one week follow-up. Um, but this was you know, able to be um, capturing something on a really acute time scale that your typical kind of clinical interview measures aren't gonna be able to do. They're capturing things over a much broader time frame. But interestingly, you know, we're encouraged that there was at least some mod modest correlations between this lab measure and the gold standard um, clinical interview for OCD symptoms called the Y box. So it looks like we're picking up on something clinically relevant, but in this really acute time frame. Okay, so we found that we can push the, the OFC up and down um, to create this window of opportunity for the for the habit override learning to occur. So this um, this up on the top, you just see these were our regions of interest for um, the orbital frontal cortex, the Broadman's areas that we were trying to, to target. And here you see the, the down below, you see the shift in um, the uh, cerebral blood flow that we captured in neuroimaging. And you can see in the green bar that the CTBS pulled it down and the red bar that the ITBS pushed it up. So we were, our kind of manipulation check was successful that we could move this, the brain region in two different directions with these two kinds of, of theta burst stimulation. But then in terms of behavior, what we saw was pretty interesting. So the the blue line are the CTBS group who had their OFC pulled down with the, with the neuromodulation. So they, at 90 minutes after our single little burst of TBS, were already starting to do better than the other group on um, their average urge strength, their time spent in compulsive behaviors, and their effort needed to resist during the stressful laboratory probe that was, you know, ideographically tailored to their real world compulsive behaviors. But then, you know, at one week they came back. We've done nothing further, and the the if anything, the group the effect of the group had increased over the course of that week. So this um, suggested possibly a durability of the effect on behavior that exceeded what we typically see um, if, a, if such a single brief burst of TMS was given in isolation. So we speculated that it could be that pairing it up with the behavioral manipulation is creating some kind of synergy that gives it a, a bit more of a um, enduring effect that you can see lasting a full week. Um, so in this study, we, you know, we concluded that it was the, 
the bottom hypothesis that was the winner. So it was pulling the OFC down from perhaps this overactive baseline. So it's not just driving a habitual response all the time that seemed to synergistically help a, um, an individual learn to enhance their goal-directed override of habits. And this was very, um, very much in line with Suzanne's optogenetic work in the mouse models where she found that pushing the OFC up generates compulsive-like behaviors. Um, so we concluded that we can maybe create this window of opportunity to efficiently learn to override habits with this brief neuromodulation ex um, experiment, but this really highlights how you know, again, the OFC plays diverse functional roles in human behavior. So when we create this different, this behavioral training that's paired together with the neuromodulation, maybe what we're doing is isolating the specific desired mechanisms that we want to help somebody with. Um, so this has potential implications for down the road synergistic treatment development. So maybe pairing TBS with something like our little hot automated habit override training as an intervention, or even more broadly, um, pairing it with our gold standard um, psychotherapies for com compulsive behaviors like exposure and response prevention, which ultimately act on very much this, this, a similar kind of conceptual um, target. Um, so that is um, the work that we've done there. And then we have ongoing work where we're um, designing the study better to be able to answer more of the questions. So um, this is now an, an ongoing R01 study where we're putting our money squarely now on CTBS, since that was the one that seemed to be helpful in our first study, um, and randomizing people to either sham or active CTBS. That way we can really verify that the CTBS is helping and it's not somehow that the ITBS was hurting. So the CTBS versus sham, um, randomization. And then we also have a fully factorial design. So we can really tease out, is it the combination of the behavioral manipulation and the not overriding habits at all, um, then you won't see that same effect that kind of generalizes to the clinical syndrome itself. But it's specifically when you give that synergistic context and pair it up with CTBS that we should see this generalized capacity to override your real world um, compulsive behaviors that you're struggling with. Okay, so that is my first example of how we've tried to tackle this. And now I'm going to move to my second example, um, which uses a pharmacological manipulation to induce plasticity short term. And again, tries to leverage that as a window of opportunity where we can go in with, again, a, a computer based treatment, a different one this time to kind of um, see if we can promote a protective form of learning. Okay, so um, this in this study, we were using intravenous ketamine. Um, and this is something that researchers serendipitously um, found, discovered, has these rapid acting antidepressant effects. Um, going back now, um, the initial um, serendipitous publication was in 1999. So this has been known for a while. And it's something that you know, has been talked about as maybe giving this, this potential to address more urgent clinical needs, to get people well more quickly, because you see this depression relief achieved in hours instead of the weeks to months that, that conventional antidepressant medications take. And it happens to be a really well-known medication with a well-established safety profile. It's on the WHO's essential medicines list um, because it's an, it's an anesthetic that's used um, for sedation of a, children and adults and is considered a quite safe anesthetic, but now we're giving it in sub-anesthetic lower doses and seeing that it has also these, these rapid acting antidepressant properties. So cleverer people than me have called this really important. So Tom Insull, the former NIMH director called it the most important breakthrough in antidepressant treatment in decades. Um, my former collaborator, Ron Duman, up, one upped him and said, oh, it's the most important breakthrough in a half century. Um, and then we have you know the most important authority figure of all, 
uh, my mom who saw on the news that ketamine would be available in March 2019 as the first new antidepressant in 30 years, which isn't exactly correct, but it's it's pretty close. And this just shows that, um, you know, this enthusiasm really permeates out there to, to people just watching the news because people understand what a need there is for something like this that that really could be a game changer. So there, obviously there, there's, um, there's a lot of excitement here, a lot of hype. And so this is one of the earlier studies. This is a 2005 study from Carlos Cerati's group, um, just to kind of show you in more depth what the, the, um, the data looked like and that, that created all this enthusiasm. So you see that the orange line are people who got, you know, this was a crossover design. So when people got a infusion, a single infusion of intravenous ketamine, their depression starts to come down within about two hours. And then it, the antidepressant effect peaks at 24 hours after that single infusion um, relative to the saline control that they used in this particular study. And then the panel on the right is showing that the responder rate, the, the percentage of patients who show quite a profound impact of the single infusion of ketamine is at upwards of 70%, which can fair, compares favorably to what you'd expect to see after a full eight weeks of a conventional um, antidepressant medication like an SSRI. So now, you know, we can fast forward about 15 or years from, from that initial discovery and ask, you know, how well is this held up? Is it really all it's cracked up to be? So um, in a recent uh, project that I took on with um, my wonderful statistician collaborators, Meredith Wallace and Nick Kissel, we um, undertook a individual patient level me meta-analysis or mega-analysis. So in this kind of meta-analysis, what you, instead of having just one data point per study, as you do in a standard meta-analysis, you have one data point per participant in the original study. And so you can ask new questions, like we were trying to ask which specific patients are most likely to show a benefit from a single infusion of ketamine in, in randomized studies. Um, but in this study, one of the things we, we, we could do is just kind of revisit the responder rate for a single infusion of ketamine after compiling 17 RCTs that were completed across eight different countries um, in over 800 patients. And so what we got now was a 46% overall response rate to ketamine. So it's lower than what looked like in those initial studies, but it's still very clearly um, separated, separating from the placebo groups, even in studies that used more rigorous placebo arms like a psychoactive comparator, such as midazolam, which has often been used. So the, the, this, this, Rapid on onset antidepressant effect is pretty robust and has shown kind of stood the test of time when it comes to ketamine. We were, um, as I mentioned, we were trying to figure out, okay, which patients do best. And the, the panel in the middle is just showing you one of the few moderators that we actually did find was the level of treatment resistance. So patients who were more resistant had had, had more failures to previous um, antidepressant trials that were adequate duration um, and dose were um, showing a stronger differential effect of ketamine versus placebo. So if anything, you know, the more treatment resistant you are, then the more likely you are to get an added benefit from ketamine versus placebo. Um, so what exact, what exact mechanisms account for this noteworthy clinical finding? This is um, volumes and volumes and volumes of, of research has been done on this oh, ever since that initial discovery um, started to kind of come into the forefront. Um, and it's still very much an ongoing debate, which I'm not going to wade too deep into. Um, but this particular um, review article did a nice job of highlighting how you can have sort of these different um, choose your own adventure um, uh, kind of points that you might think are the, the most important cascading events, but at the end of the day, all of them seem to culminate in acute changes in synaptic plasticity as being a really important mechanism that ultimately um, leads to the um, antidepressant-like changes in behavior that you would see in animal models. So here's one of the kind of um, classic findings that are that are re still relatively dominant in our understanding of how ketamine works. Um, so this is that same slide I, I began with showing the effect of chronic stress on um, dendrites and the synaptic disconnectivity. And you see that um, 24 hours after a single infusion of ketamine in an animal model, the panel all the way over to the right is showing the kind of re 
growth of this, the synapses that had been depleted by the chronic stress. So um, in a really particularly elegant study that was published in 2012, um, no, sorry, 2019 by Moda Sava and Connor Liston and colleagues, um, they, they showed that you, after a single dose of ketamine, um, you see these new synapses come in as had been shown many times before on um, medial PFC, um, spiny synapses. Um, and they then could go in with an optogenetic tool and selectively delete just those new synapses that ketamine had caused to sprout. And if they deleted them, they no longer saw all of the, the antidepressant-like effects in the animal model. So this was pretty um, strong evidence that, that those new synapses are quite important in, in the behavioral effect. Um, so, but so much of this insight currently still comes from animal studies. So there's a, really a lot still to uncover with respect to how these sorts of mechanisms actually get us all the way to a clinical improvement. And so one of the goals of a recently completed study was to fill in some of those gaps in, in human um, patients with depression after a single infusion of either ketamine or saline and measure a lot of different levels of analysis where we might expect to see plasticity effects. So I'm going to touch, you know, this is a mountainous trove of data that we're still trying to slog our way through. I'm going to touch on a few of the things that have, have come out so far. Um, the first one is way down at this um, level of kind of the synaptic um, synaptogenesis effects and how we might capture those in human patients in vivo. So we used a specific form of diffusion weighted imaging um, to capture microstructural change in gray matter. So usually DTI and, uh, is used to look at white matter, tractography and such, but this is looking at gray matter. And my collaborator, um, Tim Keller, had used this in some interesting experiments in, in healthy people, showing that you can capture with this measure um, the, the rapid um, generation of synapses, um, you know, at, not certainly not directly, indirectly, it seems to be a marker of the learning that occurs when somebody practices a new spatial maze for 45 minutes. So you see, if you scan them, then they learn this new maze, then you scan them again, you see this change in the in what's called the mean diffusivity marker, um, which is inversely related to microstructure like stuff being there, because it's a measure of how smoothly the water's flowing. So when there's more little bits and pieces in its way, then it's the mean diffusivity will come down. And that suggests that something new is there, perhaps um, new synapses. And there's other animal studies that have directly, more directly linked this particular type of, of um, DWI marker to neuroplasticity mechanisms more broadly. So we used it before and after our single infusion of either ketamine or saline. And this was my postdoc, Jared Kopelman, who's now resident at UCSD, who really spearheaded the, the analyses here. Um, so in our sample, we can look at the, the correlations um, what you're seeing on the um, y-axis is the percent change in depression. So the more you improved, the higher your score would be there. And then on the x-axis, you see the, um, the degree of change in this mean diffusivity marker for each individual. So we didn't see that ketamine overall produced a, a shift in these markers relative to saline, but we did see that the individuals who were feeling the best, the individuals who were having the, the largest antidepressant response also showed the greatest shift in what looks like this marker of, um, of neuroplasticity within the left medial PFC and also within the left amygdala. And that relationship was specific to ketamine and not to saline. Um, but in the hippocampus, we found something we weren't expecting, just the opposite pattern. So some the people who were feeling the best um, after that single infusion of ketamine, they actually had a decrease in their um, neuroplasticity marker in the hippocampus, which was not what we hypothesized. Um, but I'm very interested in whether, you know, um, listening to Kiara's talk of kind of what are the, the adaptive um, forms of downregulation of plasticity that could possibly account for this. It's, a, it's an open question. Um, okay, so next I'm gonna just touch on some of the um, ketamine's very acute impacts on cognition and the role that those changes might play in its antidepressant effects. Um, so I am so bursting with pride that I have not one, but two travel awardees here this, this year. Um, both are shown here, Ben Panny and Julia Apfelbacher, and both 
actually were instrumental in this particular analysis I'm about to show. So Ben had an interest in awe, the construct of awe, and had done an honors thesis on awe when he came to work for me in, on my ketamine study. And so he suggested, why don't we add a, a measure of this idea of having a, being awestruck, having an awe-invoking experience? And this is you know, one of the one of the um, most prominent researchers in this area is Dacher Keltner, who has described awe as the when we encounter vast mystery or something that requires us to recalibrate our knowledge structures to make sense of what you have just encountered. So we're trying to understand whether the, the experience of a ketamine infusion, which comes along with various um, side effects that have been measured in various ways, but maybe there's something special about that that's awe-inspiring to people that's, that strikes them in the same way that standing on the precipice of the Grand Canyon might, might stre uh, strike someone as, as I did myself with my children a couple of weeks back. So it turns out that there was this validated questionnaire of awe that asks about things like my sense of self has been diminished. I had the sense of being connected to everything. And these are, these are kind of the prominent features that Dacher Keltner's group has found to be related to um, an experience of awe. So we just asked people after, right after their infusion, whether they got saline or ketamine, they were asked this set of questions. And the ketamine group was endorsing a lot of these types of awe-like experiences um, relative to the saline group. So they really were um, reporting that they were experiencing these types of things during the infusion itself. And then even more interestingly, um, we did some mediation analyses and found that the um, this pathway where the treatment ketamine versus saline is leading to these rapid antidepressant effects and even um, out to 30 days, there's a mediation pathway through the awe scale scores collected just at 40 minutes right after the infusion that are that are quite robust and and lasting over this long longer time frame. Um, so after one single infusion, so here's showing you one of the scatter plots. This is the Madras scores. That's the the primary depression outcome from the trial um, at day 30, and it's correlating with the awe experiences that the per individual reported at 40 minutes after their infusion. And this is just in the ketamine arm that I'm showing you here. But I, th I thought it was particularly interesting that this was not at all the case for the CAD score, which is a, a broad and kind of generic measure of dissociative side effects that has been very routinely used in ketamine studies. So there, we didn't find any relationship at any time point between just kind of more general dissociative side effects. It was very much the awe experience and the qualities of that that people were endorsing that seemed to be influential in their antidepressant response. Okay, and then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is the effect on rigid negative biases and self-representations and specifically um, the effect of ketamine on self-representations or self-schema, the way we, we implicitly associate ourself with kind of clinically relevant constructs. So this actually goes all the way back to the poster that I did as a travel awardee in 2009. This is the first study where we looked at this and this is the implicit association test, which many of you might be familiar with, but it's just a behavioral performance-based mark Marker where if your if your mental um, structure seems to associate me with the term escape more strongly, then you're going to be faster to push um, the key that corresponds to those categories when they're paired together, because you're supposed to be classifying words that come up in the middle of the screen as fast as you can. So if me and escape are very, very close in mind, then you're going to be a little faster when they're paired like this compared to another critical block where we swap them. And now me and stay require the same button press. And so it gives us a behavioral marker of, of how associated two things are um, and how associated something is with yourself. And we had found way back in 2009 that uh, 24 hours after a ketamine infusion, you see this rapid dip down in the, um, the ketamine um, treated patients. This was an open label, small study, um, but you see this, this shift in their performance on the task where they're now, they're now um, ha having a decrease in their association between escape and me after a single infusion of ketamine. 
And this was correlated, we were, we were focused on suicidal cognition in this particular study. So that, that association between escape in me as well as the association between death in me was correlated quite strongly with how much improvement the person showed in their ex explicit suicidal ideation, their clinical marker of suicidal risk. So um, we did a much better job in, in our 2014 study with a randomized design much larger sample, a medazolam control that controls for some of the sedating and psychoactive properties of ketamine, but still saw the same rapid shift in the performance on, on the escape equals me marker um, that was specific to the ketamine arm and wasn't seen in the medazolam arm. Um, so this led, led to thinking about, you know, if there's plasticity at this information processing level and in, there's plasticity in self-representations maybe that ketamine introduces, can we use that um, to inform the development of a treatment? And so if we think of depression as being this kind of dysfunctional, sparse network that we began with in terms of kind of just not having enough roads for the brain to flexibly traverse, um, maybe it's the ketamine kind of airdrops in a lot of bits and pieces of road where suddenly flexible cognition becomes more possible, different ways of thinking and being become possible. So maybe that's a window of opportunity to introduce a computer training that will um, capitalize on that type of plasticity that's there, specifically the self-representations, which is a core feature of depression to have this really prominent low self-worth. Can we rehabilitate self-esteem rapidly in that window of opportunity and create a protective, enduring state that would keep somebody, that would be antithetical to depression and keep them protected from depression for a longer stretch of time. So it's kind of shockingly simple what we use to do that. We just are using classical conditioning, just like Pavlov's dogs heard the bell, got food, heard the bell, got food, became associated that the bell equals food. So we're just doing that um, through these paradigms on the computer, collectively known as evaluative conditioning. This has been studied a lot in, in social psychology, but not so much at all in clinical psychology. But basically, it's the same thing that advertisers are trying to do if they're pairing their product with things that you might like like smiling faces of wonderful people they're just trying to make you like the product and this is our way of trying to make somebody help somebody like themselves through these these uh these paradigms so we did one that was um based on words and so we used the letter i to stand in for this the idea of myself and we in some of these um in in the first set of tasks it was presented subliminally for 17 milliseconds and then followed by a positive attribute or positive word for 17 milliseconds. So all kind of below conscious perception. And then we did a second block just to cover our bases that was super liminal. So in those ones, you could see the letter I very clearly on the screen for half a second. You could see a positive item on the screen for half a second. Everybody got all of those things if they were in the active group. And we called this all associated self-associate self-association training or ASAT, um, affectionately known as ASAT. So that's what I'll refer to it as going forward. So um, ASAT involves all of these repetitions that can be done quite efficiently and quickly to try to create these, these um, positive self-associations. And then you can create a, a great sham control for it by just giving the exact same computer tasks, but removing the self-related and therapeutic content. So they would see the letter A followed by neutral words, but they're still doing the same little computer game, still making some incidental um, responses, like does this start with a vowel or not, et cetera. And they're doing that for, um, for a stretch of hundreds of repetitions. And then they go into a pictorial form where if they were in the active ASAT arm, they, we took pictures of them and they are clicking, they're told to just click on pictures that appear on the screen in one of four spots. And when, the, if they're in the ASAT arm, when they click on their own photo in that same location, it's replaced immediately by a smiling face from a standardized set used in, in many psychology experiments. And they get many, many repetitions of that. The sham version, they were clicking on strangers' photos and seeing a, a range of, um, of face uh, expressions pop up right after. And so all of this together takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do, and we asked them to do it twice a day for four days. Um, so in, we had this randomized control trial where the, um, the blue line are people who got a saline infusion followed by those ASAT exercises. So the other two arms both got ketamine, but the gray arm got ketamine followed by sham 
exercises and the orange got ketamine followed by the real ASAT exercises. So we have a control that got the drug, but not the behavioral component and a control that got the behavioral component, but not the drug. So we can really tease out, is there something special about the combination? So we get this one single infusion. We have the four days, 20 minutes or less, um, well, total of 30 to 40 minutes a day for four days consecutively right after the infusion where we thought we would be in this window of opportunity to introduce that. And then we did nothing else. That was the whole intervention. So what you see here is that the gray line shows the typical pattern you would expect from one single infusion of ketamine. You get this rapid improvement in depression and then it starts to dissipate. And after a week to two weeks, people are mostly back up to where the placebo arm is. But the orange line is more flat and it stayed flat for the entirety of the 30 days that we were measuring um, with our primary outcome, the Madras um, interview. So we then, it doesn't look like it's even starting to wane um, at the 30 days. So we looked at the self-report measures that we got for an entire year. And the self-report depression stayed lower than the other two arms for an entire 90 days after this, this really, really tightly packed kind of efficient, um, almost like surgical strike type of intervention. So this is encouraging that we're seeing something that's lasting um, a bit of time from, from such a minimal um, amount of intervention that we actually did. So the question that we're now thinking about is, okay, well, where is that really useful? Where is there an unmet need that we might be able to fill with something that fits in a tight window um, and can be done efficiently, but then maybe buffer somebody for a while? So one, one place where that comes to mind is in the area of treating someone who's just had a suicide attempt. And so we're really fortunate, uh, and I'm very fortunate to collaborate with um, these phys physicians who are really interested in being able to um, give an intervention within the, the inpatient context where they're working with these patients. Um, and so we kind of embedded that whole idea of the study design with randomizing to either ketamine or, or no ketamine, and then further randomizing to either ASAT or SHAM. And we're, we're giving that all to patients while they're undergoing medical stabilization and then psychiatric inpatient stay following a suicide attempt. And this is just hypo hypotheses that I'm showing here and not real data yet, but I'm just, we're hoping that maybe we can see something that lasts longer and helps um, protect such the, these vulnerable patients from um, the very severe risk that they have of kind of repeated suicidal behaviors. Um, and in this, this is very much an effectiveness trial. So we're also collecting tons of feedback and kind of acceptability and satisfaction measures from our participants um, to make sure that this kind of works in the real world and that patients might actually be interested to do it, um, it as, a, as a treatment as opposed to like as part of a research study. And you can see that both the, the infusion its experience as well as our ASAT exercises are rated as pretty um, satisfactory, uh, helpful, et cetera, um, upwards of 80% for uh, most of the measures that we're collecting. So this is encouraging. And it's especially encouraging to me that in this type of study where we're recruiting from a hospital-based population, where we can get a, a good kind of cross-section and a diverse representation of our local population in a way that's often really challenging in other types of kind of outpatient studies. And so we're looking even at the, the satisfaction and acceptability rate from our underrepresented minority patients and seeing that they're very much um, also finding these these this both arms of our treatment to be um, uh, something that they would have a likelihood of continuing to use and are finding to be acceptable. Um, so this is important to me because I'm hoping we can deploy this as something that's that's designed to be efficient and low, not resource intensive into some of the kind of community-based settings where our underserved communities are, are receiving care. Um, so some other next steps for this work is to see if we can do better than just three months, extend the durability with maybe additional infusions, booster bursts of ASAT, try to get this, get even more mileage out of this. Um, and, you know, look for other populations where there's an urgent need to do something that's efficient, de developed within a critical window of time when you have access to somebody. Um, and hopefully also take this simple principle of the of the evaluative conditioning or the classical conditioning and create more techniques that make a custom fit for many other forms of psychological suffering that we might be able to remediate with this simple technique. Okay, so um, 
Thank you so much again for, for having me, for listening. Um, these are some of the key um, collaborators and mentors that I didn't yet mention um, that I wanna make sure that I, I show them to you. Some of the mentors who really helped guide me throughout my trajectory. And I always need to thank my friends and family for just being supportive fixtures in my life. I'm, that's my mom. I'm trying to start a movement towards thanking our moms <laughs> in scientific presentations. So she's a good one. So thank you, mom. That's my husband, Andy. He's an acupuncturist in Pittsburgh. Um, and our two girls, Celeste and Juliet, who are the apples of our eye. So thank you again. And really happy. Oh, and thank you to NIH for supporting every single thing that I presented to you today. Um, and I'm looking forward to a nice long Q&A session here. Rebecca, that was great. Uh, and now I'd like to call up uh, Stephanie Ward and Emma Hammond to our pre-docs and we'll lead the discussion. Better? Helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Price. I mean, this, I have so many questions, so I'm going to do my best to narrow it down. And inevitably, unfortunately, to some degree, we know the DSM-6 will probably be coming out relatively soon. And in seeing the ways that these types of treatment approaches and this integrative model of neuroplasticity can be applied across diagnostic categories, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how you would like to see this work reflected in the way that we're teaching clinicians and researchers are using these diagnostic categories to conduct their research. How can we improve upon those given what we're learning now about these cross-cutting mechanisms? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think that, you know, the um, we have a push from the funding agency in NIMH towards not, you know, over reliance on um, diagnostic categories. Um, so I think there, you know, and that that's nothing new to, you know, psychology researchers in general to understand that there are there's both heterogeneity within a diagnostic category, and then there's cross cutting features across many shared in common across many conditions. So I think that's a positive um, move to, to get people who are, you know, all of the people out there in the workforce who are doing the work to be thinking along those broader lines. I think the DSM is a different story. It serves a, a very different function and never really was designed for, um, you know, for the, the researcher um, trying to understand the etiology. It's more designed for the practitioner who needs to have a billing code or, you know, things. It's more of a pragmatic kind of um, document in my mind. So I think that it does have a serve a function in that sense that, and we do need it. Um, but, you know, as a, as a research tool, um, I think it's, you know, um, more limited in how it, it kind of implies that, that people within one category are the same as each other and dis discrete from other entities, which we know is not the case. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I really appreciate your sort of approach to um, research and how it both informs clinical work. And also I come from a more biological background. So I think it's very informative in terms of how we think about the brain more broadly. Um, and so my question is, I mean, I have sort of multiple questions in one, um, but uh is neuroplasticity, do you think it is always beneficial? And um, would increasing neuroplasticity in a more stressful setting, could that, like expanding those connections, uh, could that have the potential to make a negative or stressful experience more salient? And how does that, uh, what are the implications for that in terms of training a sort of guide or therapist um, with regards to uh, the people who are engaging in ketamine therapy and like the people who are doing work there? Yeah, that's a really fascinating question. So um, my my answer that I, that I usually give to that question is I personally don't believe we have evidence that ketamine creates a hyperplastic state. 
it, we have evidence that it rapidly restores a healthy state. So of course, you know, the brain is designed to learn and it's going to learn in particular from salient experiences, both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. So by restoring that kind of that, those, those basic fundamental learning um, capacities, then yes, it, you could then have somebody have a, a very negative experience that, you know, they, that stays with them. But um, that's not something that we, we've seen described in, you know, and at this point, ketamine really has gotten into the community as a, as a treatment that's being offered to thousands of people. So both in the research context and in the community, um, we're not seeing, you know, that there's some kind of concerning iatrogenic iatrogenic pattern there where people are like particularly vulnerable. So it seems to also fit with the neuroscience and saying like this gets people to a state of health quickly, but um, doesn't necessarily open some, some extreme degree of, mm -hmm. of vulnerability. Um, was that the whole question or did I miss the first, the first part of the question? Yeah, I think you answered all of it. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. I have couple follow-ups. Um, one in particular, I am really fascinated by this work you're hoping to do and are already doing with regard to other critically sensitive periods um, for intervention. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, deploying these methods in the context of eating disorders that are at a really critical point. I know cognitive rigidity comes into play there, but I imagine some of this would have to operate differently from an intervention point of view. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. I have a um, colleague in my department who's really interested in this question as well, um, who's an expert in eating disorders. Um, and so because of because of her interest, we've started to look a, a bit at, you know, taking the, the most recent survey of the literature here. And I, I believe that, you know, there's limited slivers of evidence that ketamine may be helpful for anorexia, for instance. And you're right that kind of conceptually, this is very much a, a, a good fit for the kinds of um, uh, patterns behaviorally and cognitively that are seen in eating disorders. So I think that there's there's work starting to be done. And, um, you know, I think that initially maybe there was hesitation around, um, you know, especially in the case of anorexia, you know, just medically and otherwise, you know, the vulnerabilities there. Um, so I think that, that you're probably going to see more work coming out in that area. Um, I have also seen um, providers going straight in and offering this. Um, and so I don't think there's really an evidence base for that at this, at this stage that we can rely on. It's, it's, a, it's a promising hint that it could be helpful and that it's not harmful, but there's still, you know, we need to proceed cautiously because where there's potential, we don't want to miss the potential by going too, too far too fast. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I do have uh, sort of one more basic question. Um, there are, I know, other sort of promising um, psychoactive substances like psilocybin that also increase neurogenesis. And there's also evidence that um, that is uh, one of the ways in which SSRIs are functioning, like, but takes longer. Um, so what, what is potentially an advantage to ketamine over a uh, different substance that may be more affordable, like easier to access, um, like psilocybin and maybe has fewer side effects? You're, are you asking just if psilocybin has fewer side effects? Well, I guess, yeah. What, what, what is ketamine, ketamine's advantage? Yeah. Over? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that this is a really great question. So, you know, when I, when we started, when I start, got into this research and when others, even but my predecessors got into this, I, I never saw the word psychedelic applied to ketamine. So it's been interesting over the past, you know, three, four years with other psychedelics coming into the forefront within psychiatry kind of treatment um, research that now that label is often applied to ketamine. And I think that there's important differences um, and their similarities. So yeah, there's there's certain overlap potentially in these neuroplasticity-based mechanisms. Certainly there's very different kind of prom primary um, 
uh, receptor actions, uh, you know, the, they're, they're completely distinct, you know, from psilocybin, LSD acting on serotonergic predominantly, and ketamine is a glutamatergic agent acting on NMDA receptors. So they're doing different things. They may ha- kind of end up at the same final common endpoint in some ways. Um, but the other thing that's really different um, in the literatures is that in the, in the psychedelics Um, research, so much of the emphasis has been on assisting a psychotherapeutic process along, which I think is, you know, really fascinating. And the idea that, you know, you're using and leveraging the acute, um, the acute shift in conscious state um, after an administration of psilocybin as like a very integral part of the therapy, right? That, that is not what's been done um, in ketamine research historically. So in the, in the community, Yes, people are doing ketamine-assisted psychotherapies of various kinds, but um, they're still not doing much during the ketamine administration because people are quite sedated. Mm-hmm. So there's not really that much you can do. So in our studies, we've always started everything a day later, so that you know the all of the the acute conscious um, shifts are are well um, gone by that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I think it's you know there's a lot of interesting opportunity to understand like how how similar, you know, how important are those, um, those conscious shifts that you do get with ketamine? That was, that's a question that wasn't really asked very seriously for a long time, but, you know, I showed you some of the findings that we're getting, which actually, um, you know, honestly surprised me. I was more, uh, um, raised in the philosophy that those are just side effects you know, they're just a nuisance. They come and go, but there's something else, the neuroplasticity stuff that kind of kicks in later, and, you know, so I think it's really fascinating that we're seeing, um, you know, that maybe there is something really important about, qualitatively about the experience during the infusion. And that's, that's very much what, you know, the many of the one camp within the psychedelics kind of um, vein is, is very certain of that, there, that there's something about the, the experiential qualities of those medic- medicines that are important therapeutically. But then you do have still another camp that says, oh, we, we don't think that's important at all. We want to, um, you know, create new compounds that achieve the neuroplasticity without any, um, conscious alterations at all. And so, you know, it's, these are really challenging questions to answer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one, one, um, study that could answer this, that I don't think, um, the, uh, when it comes to ketamine, um, that I don't think has come out yet is, um, you know, interestingly, since ketamine is still classified as an anesthetic, it's used by anesthesiologists in every hospital. Um, and they often use it as part of a kind of a cocktail. So they'll give a low dose of ketamine and then follow that by general anesthesia that puts somebody completely under. So there, there's some studies now trying to understand. And of course, after surgery, you have an acute risk of depression. So there's an interesting kind of opportunity there to, to within the, the standard practice, Practices are being used to understand whether ketamine, when you give a low dose of ketamine and then put somebody to sleep so that they don't experience that at all, they have no like conscious experience of the ketamine, does it still have anti- antidepressant kind of protective effects afterwards? I'll be really interested to see what the answer is to that. Um, so th- I think that you asked a, another question too, which is more about um, kind of pros and cons um, of the, you know, and limitations of, and advantages. So with ketamine, just practically speaking, it's available now. There's um, intranasal S ketamine is FDA approved. So you have a, an availability and you have a familiarity with this medication, um, with it being, you know, an anesthe- a form of anesthesia that's been available since the seventies. You have a lot more that's known about the safety profile. You have, you know, um, you have, so you have kind of more in the, in the short run, you have an availability. And so it's often now, now that, um, the psychedelic stuff has become so prominent, I often see it advertised as the only FDA approved psychedelic, um, which it isn't, it's being used off label, but it's FDA approved as an anesthesia and which is something you certainly can't say for psilocybin or LSD. So, um, that you that's sort of an advantage in the short term um but in the long term you know the the potential that i see for for things like psilocybin in that literature is the long lastingness of it you know so that's that's a problem that we tried to solve with ketamine by pairing it with the behavioral treatment and maybe that's another approach but if you're just talking about ketamine alone the primary thing that keeps people from being able to access it is 
the, the cost, but the cost compounded with how many, how short lasting it is. So you have to keep going back. It's costly because it's usually out of pocket, but even if it's covered by insurance, which sometimes it can be, it's costly in terms of the investment of time and the burden on the patient to go back and have to, um, you know, get this in the office and be monitored for safety, et cetera. So the, the, um, yeah, if anything that can extend the durability and really kind of move, um, us towards fast and enduring, um, treatments is, is very exciting to me. So. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's open it up and maybe I can start um, with asking one question, Rebecca. Um, the, uh, the work that you're doing with ASAT and pairing it with ketamine is, um, is so interesting and promising. Uh, uh, and it seems to be predicated on the view that, um, uh, that at least as I'm understanding it, that, that the purpose of ASAT is really to change uh, a person's self-related thoughts and cognition. Um, uh, uh, and one of the alternatives that I wonder if you've considered, uh, instead of directly changing uh, a person's self-related cognition, is to really work on the relationship that a person has with that self-related cognition. And so there are uh, as you well know, certain kinds of strategies like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy or other approaches from the contemplative traditions that um, it, with regard to self-related cognition, don't so much target changing the self-related cognition itself, but rather uh, seeing it for what it is, so to speak, uh, 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 as a more um, uh, uh, impermanent constellation of, of thoughts. Uh, and it seems that the subjective experiences uh, during ketamine may actually help with uh, that kind of approach rather than directly changing the cognitions themselves. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So I think that um, the, the, the providers in the community, um, many of them ascribe to that idea and are very much, you know, this idea of ketamine assisted psychotherapy is very much trying to leverage insights about, um, you know, yeah, kind of having a more diminished sense of self during the, um, during the infusion or having a different way of relating to perceptions or connections to others, et cetera, trying to kind of, you know, integrate that, revisit it, and talk about what that implies about, you know, the way we relate to um, our our self construct and all constructs in that are that we kind of um, go through life, you know, taking for granted. So I think that that there's a lot of um, of interest there, and a lot of people who agree with you. I think where we're lacking is in the research data right now to to really show that there's some added benefit because ketamine alone has a very large effect on depression. So um, it can be really hard to then tease apart, you know, is, is there actually added benefit for those more cognitive um, focused interventions that are being given hand in hand when we when we lack randomized um, controlled designs for it. So I share your interest in that. We have a little pilot study right now where we're, we've just tried to randomize people to a, a little mini, mini mindfulness um, training just before the infusion or, or not, and just see whether, you know, kind of building on the awe, ex awe findings, like, can we amplify, um, the person's, um, experience and, and awareness of that experience during the infusion by giving in mindfulness instructions just before, and then throughout the infusion, as opposed to just how we've always done it so far in my studies and in many studies where you just give the ketamine, you don't do anything else special. You don't do the, you don't do the, the eye shades or the music or the relaxing chair. It's just, just a drug that you're giving. So we're trying to get, at least start to, to ask that question with a randomized design, because I think that's where, where we really need um, more information. Get up.
Uh, thank you. That was really cool. Uh, for me, it's interesting because I've actually done ketamine infusions. So it's kind of interesting with the way you were talking about it, some of the suspicions I've had regarding it. So one of the questions I have uh, talking about awe, do we have, do we understand why ketamine in particular is able to evoke awe? Or is that, is that something that's compared to other different drugs? I guess that's kind of the question I'm wondering. Yeah, it's, that's a really great question. I don't think so. I don't think anyone's ever studied awe per se in ketamine before we threw it into our battery. So I think that there's a lot more um, questions that we can dig into and ask even in our own data set of kind of what, what else, you know, we have an, a relationship between awe and, and clinical symptoms. We also had a relationship between the DTI measure I showed you and clinical symptoms. So I would really love to have a grand plan for kind of integrating everything that we have to understand which pieces of the puzzle are, are working hand in hand or kind of different, you know, different mechanisms of, of one whole and maybe, and, and perhaps there's also within there different pathways to a benefit for different patients, you know, so maybe there are some people that that the awe experience doesn't matter at all, but they still benefit from ketamine. Whereas for, for some, you know, so I think that, that all of that heterogeneity that's in there and, um, and within this kind of multi-pronged data set is, is capable to tackle that question that you're asking, but I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there, these types of experiences, um, kind of mystical type experiences have been studied much more so in the realm of other um, agents, other kind of psychedelics and such. But there is a, a literature growing on that in, in ketamine. And in particular, in uh, where it's been more prominent for whatever reason, kind of maybe just the people that, that are studying it have been more interested in it is in the area of using ketamine to treat alcohol and substance use disorders. So there's a lot more that we see there in terms of kind of the specific qualities of the experience that seem to be then tracking with abstinence from your, your dependent substance, substance afterwards, such as um, one of the ones that's come out is that um, the degree to which the experience is ineffable, um, which means can't be put into words. And if people are saying like, I can't put into words what I experienced during the infusion, then they're actually the ones who are showing the most long lasting or, or strongest benefits for substance use disorder. So there's just, it's a, it's a much smaller literature in depression, but it's starting to, to catch up, I think. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this fascinating cutting edge work. Um, my So this question comes from my colleague who was joining remotely, but had to sign off for clinic, um, but wanted to make sure this was addressed. Um, so she's saying, I'm wondering how this approach of brain informed targeted treatment works in the context of patients with dysregulation in multiple underlying sy uh, systems. So in particular, thinking of folks with early history of complex trauma who often present with severe comorbid treatment related diseases um, and likely have changes within multiple brain systems. Um, so in a treatment context, um, would you defer to current resource intensive evidence-based treatments like DBT um, to try to create a sort of individualized combination therapy um, or target one system at a time um, without um, like starting with the one causing the most issues. So basically approaching, um, you know, folks who have multiple dysregulation. Thank you. Thank you for passing that along. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that um, there, it's such a great question, you know, that people don't have just one thing that's that's troubling them. They usually have many, many different pieces of the puzzle. And so um, we've so far tried to go after a core substrate that's very prominent and potentially transdiagnostic. So for instance, you know, self-representation, self-worth, I would put in that category and potentially even um, in, uh, decrease goal-directed behavior, like I was talking about in the compulsive behavior study. Um, 
so that there you can, you know, potentially have a tool that might, you know, you could hope that if you, if you get at something that's quite at the core of, of, um, an, you know, sort of like the core of the onion in, in Beck's cognitive therapy, if you get down to, um, a level that's, that's got kind of different ripple effects, then maybe you have an efficient way to help somebody, but will that, will that help every patient to get them all the way better? Absolutely not. You know, that, that would be naive to think that. So I think that perhaps the, the vision over time is to have, you know, modules of this kind of thing where you can still be efficient in what you're doing, pick a few core targets for a person, you know, ideally have, um, you know, precision medicine tools that can guide that like assessments that, that get you that answer, that profile of like, okay, here's what needs to, to be targeted first, try this first and do that efficiently, you know? And, and if, if the, you know, the treatment as a whole is one day or four days, then you have a, a little bit more, uh, wiggle room for, for some, you know, trial and error and to kind of fit multiple things in, as opposed to when you have a treatment course, that's two, three months, and then you learn that it's, you know, that it's not helping. So I think that's kind of what the vision, um, that, that probably not just me, but, you know, many people, um, have for this, but we're nowhere near that yet. And I, I fully acknowledge that this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and you know, there, there's ultimately going to be, um, a need for many different tools within this repertoire for different, for different people suffering from different, um, etiologies, different kind of clinical phenomenologies, et cetera. Thank you so much. Hi. Yeah. Thank you for this talk. I really appreciate the framing around neuroplasticity. Um, and I come from an animal behavior background. And so I'm really interested in thinking about this from the perspective of like evolution and like the full organism adaptation to its environment. Um, so I'm wondering how this idea of neuroplasticity being defined as the brain's capacity to respond and adapt, how that fits in with this that there's kind of a framing of depression as it can be like an adaptive response to stress, like from Jake Panksepp and, and others, um, how it fits in with depression being like a state that the organism goes into in order to, in order to like get through and, and survive and how neuropla the, the neuroplasticity framing fits into that. Um, so I just want to understand the question fully. So, sure. um, are you, are you asking, you know, if somebody's, um, if somebody's circumstances are such that depression is almost like the logical or, or adaptive outcome to those circumstances, then is it the wrong place to work, um, to work on the individual should be, should be, we be focusing on fixing the circumstances. I think that's part, I, I think even use, maybe using the word adaptive is wrong because it's maybe the, the body's response is meant is adaptive, but it ends up actually having costs and not fitting the environment, even though in a different context, or maybe in, in the past, it would have fit their environment. And now there's a mismatch. Um, so yeah, I guess more it, it's about like how that idea of it, of, depression being like a, a mismatch to response to what's actually happening, what's actually going to work in, in the environment. I know this is a very like kind of vague. Of, like, yeah, no, no, no. I, I really appreciate the, the line of thought. Um, it's something I think about too. So yeah, I think um, one way that I sometimes think about it is, as you said, you know, maybe there's a, there's um, certain um, environmental inputs or circumstances that come first and the organism in a, um, in a kind of, um, evolutionarily preserved manner re reacts to those in, in such a way. Right. But then, you know, I, I, I think of it as, you know, certain learning occurs in response to that. And then you kind of have this double 
whammy where the, the plasticity also is decreased. So therefore that learning becomes more entrenched because the, the brain is then less flexible going forward to, as you said, kind of maybe see that there, the, the light at the end of the tunnel has been reached and maybe those acute circumstances are now resolved or what have you, but there, the brain is still sort of stuck in that, um, that initial set. So that's where I, I kind of conceptualize neuroplasticity boosts as being something where we can come along and help somebody, um, get back to a responsive, more, you know, flexible state of, um, being able to kind of see different avenues with different paths forward, et cetera. Is that, is that getting at your question? Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So I had a follow-up question. I think substance abuse was briefly mentioned, but I wanted to ask, um, I study cognitive and habit circuits underlying opioid addiction. And I was wondering, have any of your participants experienced substance abuse along with depression or were you just studying depression like isolated? And if so, did um, the ketamine help with their substance abuse or just the addiction or just the depression? Uh, that's a great question. So in, in the study that I showed today, we excluded people who had ongoing substance use disorders, which has definitely been the norm in these studies and depression. And um, I think it's definitely a, an a important limitation um, to keep in mind because that's not, um, you know, capturing then the full course of uh, the, the full gamut of people who are struggling with depression and particularly those that are at the risk of kind of the worst outcomes when they have multiple um, things working against them. So um, I think that there's definitely a need to, to ask that question. And in the effectiveness trial that we're doing in suicide attempt um, survivors, those people are not excluded based on substance use disorders and because of the, the, um, the risk factors related to suicide, suicide attempts, we do see a rather large percentage who have ongoing substance use disorders. So with that data set, we should be able to get at your question a bit better because we'll be tracking over time, you know, what happens with both depression and substance related um, symptoms. Um, but then there also is a, a totally separate literature that has shown that a single infusion of ketamine can help individuals with cocaine dependence, individuals with alcohol dependence, um, and there's also a study that um, did um, do what what uh, Richie was asking about, where they combined ketamine in, infusions with mindfulness interventions in a kind of interleaved way and had a good randomized design for that one and found, in, I believe that was an alcohol use disorder that they could um, in, improve abstinence outcomes with the combination of the two. So there's, there's kind of these parallel literatures, but right now there's not much data at the intersection where people are allowed into the studies with kind of all of the above. So just to follow up, thank you. But um, I was wondering if, if you um, did not include people who have ongoing substance um, abuse. Did you include people that had previously um, had some su substance abuse issues? And did you ask them if they happened to like relapse after like the ketamine infusion? Um, we just didn't have many of those people. I mean, we did, we did have a cutoff of, um, I can't remember if it was six months or, or 12 months. Um, but I don't think we had enough people in the sample who had that more remote history of substance use um, to answer that question. But I can tell you, we didn't see in our measures that we get each month of, um, which included some substance use measures, we didn't see any um, increase in, in symptoms in the full sample, but the, there weren't many of those people in the category that you're describing. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, do we have time for one more? For some more. Okay. My name is Matt Peverell. I'm a postdoc here in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, thanks so much for a great talk. Um, I was curious you know, from your from this discussion, you know, I gathered the, there's a this is a very exciting area and we're still learning a lot about ketamine. And there's also a lot of people seeking ketamine assisted treatment and providing ketamine assisted treatment. Um, I just wondered, you know. Yeah, how do you how do you feel about that? Like, what do you how, what do you think the amount of evidence about ketamine assisted psychotherapy? Um, how much of it is it? Are there risks that are kind of underexplored? Like, you know, as somebody who's investigating, you know, that treatment and how we can use it. Like, how do you feel about 
the way it's playing out right already. Um, is your question about ketamine broadly as a treatment or ketamine assisted psychotherapy in particular? I, I'm I'm more interested in ketamine assisted psychotherapy specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I th I think that um, we just don't have enough information to you know, so it kind of just comes down to personal. Um, inclinations that each person has to kind of think that it sounds like it, it makes sense or would be helpful. And that includes patients too, you know, patient, you know, of course it's really important that, that a patient, um, believe that a treatment might help them. So I think that it, ha that even for that reason alone, it's valuable to, to offer, um, Pay, you know, patients a variety of options, including, you know, ketamine without and with a, a psychotherapy, because a patient's um, expectancy about a, a improvement is a huge factor in their, in their overall improvement. So um, I think from that perspective, it, it serves a, a function, but I do think that there's a lot that's gotten ahead of the, the research data with um, ketamine treatment in, in not just in that particular vein, but, you know, in terms of um, oral and sublingual, um, treatments of ketamine that are being prescribed, you know, without the medical supervision in person, et cetera. There's a lot of these different areas where it's kind of like really exploded and moved way beyond where we have good research data to, to speak to both efficacy and safety. So. I'm going to ask a question, Rebecca, I think your work is remarkable. And, um, this particular study has really important clinical implications. Um, I was wondering, and I know the design, explain to me the design again. When does the ASAT start? Is it the, the day of the ketamine or the day after? The day after. Right. So uh, one of the questions I had was whether or not ASAT helps convert non-ketamine responders to responders. So if you look before you start the ASAT, uh, what happens to the subgroup that really does not look like they're responding? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, basically the ASAT effect is larger in the non-responders. Um, so if if somebody has a, um, a really, really, you know, it has a really strong um, effect of the ketamine and particularly those who, you know, go into full remission, then there's not as much that it seems the ASAT can add. But when, when somebody has a more equivocal response, that's where we saw the largest separation between the ASAT and the sham group. So how do you think about that in relation to a neuroplasticity hypothesis or um, the interaction between the ketamine itself, its neurochemical effects in the ASAT? Um, yeah, great question. I think um, I think of it as um, you need you need to go at it more at more levels simultaneously in order to culminate in a full kind of clinical, effect that you're trying to get to for, for some people, whereas maybe for others that just naturally happens, you know, they're the, 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 um, you know, they don't, the, yeah, the, prof, the shift is so profound that, you know, the training doesn't add as much, um, extra added value. I think it's really cool that non-ketamine responders will still respond with ASA too. That's, that's basically what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is really interesting. Other questions? That predict the that, that, that predict um, uh, which uh, of the patients uh, are gonna um, be the ones who are the who who have a, a relatively um, modest ketamine response, but uh, may be improved by the ASAT versus those that have a large ketamine remission. Uh, are there any pre-treatment um, phenotypic variables that, that predict any of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Not that I've, that we've found so far. I think that there probably um, is a signature there, but we have to you know, ask the question in the right way. Ideally, I'm hoping to use some of the techniques that some of my statistician collaborators have developed to kind of try to um, use a data-driven approach to take all the, the different pieces of the puzzle that we collect and create, you know, what, um, what Meredith Wallace has 
called a combined moderator, where it's basically a Bayesian weighted average of different variables to see if there's kind of a, a profile of who is the, the patient that's most likely to be in, in a, a favorable category. So I think we still have a lot of work to do, to, but it's a really important question. I can tell you that one thing that's come out pretty strongly is that the individuals who got ketamine and ASAT who also show a big effect on their IAT at right after ASAT are, do, are the ones who are um, doing really well all the way out to day 30 and beyond. So that just kind of more speaks to like the target engagement that the, the ASAT got at implicit self-associations among those patients. And then they, they have a lasting effect on symptoms. Maybe a, one more question. Uh, there was a question um, virtually around PTSD and whether or not you have any data with ASAT and um, ketamine or what you think of I, that. I do not. I Hopefully to, <laughs> to be continued. Yeah. I mean, there's a great literature on ketamine treatment for PTSD, although it's uh, um, smaller than the depression literature and potentially, depending on how you look at it, maybe more a little more mixed. So I think that it's a really important area to, to see how we can optimize outcomes in that population. Thanks. One more question. Thank you. Uh, my background is in pediatric primary care, and I'd love to know where you'd like to see this research go in the pediatric population. Oh, that's, that's a great question. So, um, and are you just asking broadly or about ketamine in particular? No, I'm asking more broadly, including the awe angle. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that um, there's a couple of thoughts I have on that. You know, there's been hesitation to use um, some of these tools in um, in younger research participants, which I think is just, you know, a, a, a normal progression of things. And over time, um, some studies are starting to come out in adolescents using ketamine and so showing similar efficacy. Um, but, you know, I, I just am very curious about the, the natural um, kind of plasticity that developmentally is more likely to be there at younger ages and how we might actually be able to leverage that. Um, in combination with something like ASAT, you know, and not have to give a, 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 a neuromodulation or a um, pharmacological manipulation, but kind of looking at it from that framework of where, where do we have windows of opportunity that naturally occur. Um, and the other thought I have is that um, when speaking about pediatric and adolescent depression, one of the um, largest risk factors for that is untreated depression among a parent. So I'm also really interested in kind of intergenerational um, ripple effects potentially, and it's and just kind of clinically and anecdotally, it's amazing and, and striking how many patients will come back and talk about experience, interactions they had with their family and their children um, since the infusion in a way that they hadn't been able to engage in, in for so long under the, the kind of um, you know, confines of their depression. So I think that that's an area that I'm really interested in too, is whether we can measure that, that beneficial downstream effect on families as a structure. Yeah. Okay, let's thank you again, Rebecca.